Hello everyone, welcome to tonight's episode. If you're new to the to these episodes, I would advise that um, that the best way to listen to these talks, I think, is to close your eyes so that your inner realms get practice of animating. But anyways, what if nature was on your side? You know, I'm a person who was born in 1991. And I remember that many of the shows, they weren't more culturally focused, they were more lore focused. And what I mean by that is that there was always the fascination for the supernatural. And it's as if, why are children wearing capes and trying to idolize their superheroes because they are fascinated by how ability can be acknowledged and so I find that at some point in my childhood I mean a person's eyes are they're most valuable it's like strangely your eyes are like the road of your soul are they not <coughs> And so I wanted to, in this episode, focus on speaking about a concept that in Vedanta is known as Parabrahma. Or in other cultures, it is known as the unity of the ultimate, you know. Or in more of a New Age context, it would be the notion of an oversoul. It would be the notion of an, in, an embodied mind trying to communicate with a field and pretty much the suggestion of what that could be like. So I'm a human being pretty much saying whoever is on this planet, it's not just us, there is an inner realm where its resonance or its movement is being witnessed. So we are it's like the only way we're aware that we're in lower dimensions is because we're in higher ones. Do you know what I mean? <clears throat> that means it's like we can't explain many two-dimensional things unless we look at the influence in a three-dimensional view. And I feel that we human beings, our consciousness, has boxed itself in a sort of, sort of dimensional limitation. I remember having an experience in my youth and in my childhood I would play in the yard a lot. Me and my brother, I, was, I would play sports more than games and it's, it's funny how that changes, you know. <clears throat> but I remember there was a family, very close family friend of my grandfather. Like my grandfather's like, you know, best friend. And my grandfather was on, from one angle, this like kind of business powerhouse on the other angle, like a very religious man, and this was in Iran. And I remember we had drawn two hours from Iran and we had gone to this place called Shomal, uh, uh, the north of Iran. We had dro driven two hours, uh, sorry, the north of Tehran, the capital. And so we went to this kind of like nature side and I remember people put watermelons beside the river and bought and got giant rocks to stop the watermelon. So when you put, would put the watermelon in the river and put rocks around it, it would kind of like refrigerate the watermelon. <coughs> but sometimes you'd see the watermelons go away and it's like, you know, just a random watermelon in the river. But anyways, the incident that I'm sharing, the, the main experience of this memory is that uh, we, we go in nature and before dinner, everybody's kind of looking around, going around, you know, and my grandfather's, what do you call it, uh, friend, you know, tells me to come, I want to show you something. And I won't joke, guys, this man caught a lizard with his hand in an instant. Like it was, it was so unnatural and he did something I've never seen. He slapped, he hit, what do you call it? He, he knocked on one side of the tree 
And when he knocked, the insect came from somewhere right into his hand. It was the weirdest, weirdest thing I'd seen. But this person, this friend of my grandfather, was a very big guy giving to charity. And of course, there was a religious context. You know, this isn't a Western. <laughs> this isn't like a Western movie. This is like, you know, there was a sort of very piety is kind of held in certain lines in a few radical societies. And <clears throat> anyways... So, but there was something, there was something where this person, he was very, he was always smiling, he was always uh, kind of like they would have prayer and all this, but he, he had, he could hear to me a, a voice, a melody in nature that the average man couldn't. He had, he, his, he was aware of something in nature. And I kind of, and there, the story is insane, guys, if I tell you what happened to this person. <clears throat> He was a very kind man. He was the same age as my grandfather. So, you know, he had, he had grandkids of his own. And uh, my grandfather and grandmother and that friend's name was Hoche Sanara and his, like, wife, all four of them were going to this road and this giant rock falls in the car, but it falls right in the middle of the car. So not nobody hits, but the car gets totaled. <coughs> But there was something, I don't know how to say, like some, some, some things you look at, you're acknowledging an objective phenomenon. Some things you look at, it's not an objective phenomenon. It's like a significance in how the experience is being had. I don't know how to tell you. And this is what I think Terence McKenna, Alan Watts, all these people kind of came to suggest. They're like, listen, world, you're, you're becoming, you're changing yourself too quickly before you have seen what you are. You know, in certain environments, the more complex you are, the more you're worshipped. The more, in some areas, the more simple you are, the more you fit with the crowd. Which it means that the crowds anywhere in the world are mindless. They are a coagulation of minds. <coughs> For me personally, there has been moments where I've... I've looked at my sensory perception, and then if I was to tell you what would be more than the sensory perception, it would be like this. Like right now, as I'm speaking to you, there's a certain knowing I have. I just know like these words that I'm telling you. Do you know I know their meanings? That's why I'm using them. You see that knowing? There's a knowing. Like that means whether I speak or not, the knowing is there. So that knowing in the background of one's existence is appears to the sensory as the witness but that witness it's like a side of a coin and there is a position in one state of mind in, in the moment that one can find where literally it's like how the yoga potentially sutra said excuse me guys <clears throat> Where they said it's like an orb, it's like a glass orb that moves on different colored surfaces. And I'm telling you, kind of meeting that oversoul archetype of the unconscious, or in some sense, feeling the presence of nature. Nature doesn't speak a language of words. It speaks a language of intentions that either are abiding by the nature of the design of the being or not. That means you are a certain instrument. If, you, if the instrument is played wrong, it makes a noise where life becomes vicious to it. If the instrument is played right, life falls into a sort of higher bliss. That means if you are a person that don't like animals, I'm telling you, don't go near animals. Not for the sake of them, for the sake of you. Because let me tell you, there is something about the behavior of a human being that if, it, if the attention is too much on subjectivity, in some sense, nature will push you. 
So that means there has been times where I've kind of, you can say, perceived something in my inner realms and really for a millisecond gotten attached to it. And right when I do something, something karmic happens. I notice it. You know, it's, it's kind of like strange, but it's like that glass orb, once it realizes it's not the surface, what is it? It's just pure potential. And so some people have spoken about pure thought, but I will tell you, it just comes down to the potential of the thought. That means it's like behind our eyes, we first think it's pitch black emptiness. It's just nothing there. It's like the person closed his eyes. What do you see? Nothing. It's like, you, you know, but if you are still and silent, it, believe it or not, believe it or not, the mind is like a paintbrush that the ego shouldn't use. It's like a strange paintbrush that if you're just gentle and accept the simpler, uh, like you don't you don't slap your inner child in the face, <laughs> you in some sense. Um, let me tell you, whoever you are in this life, <clears throat> a person's character is what they remember. That's why when someone gets angry, slow, so quickly a close friend of them comes and it's like, hey man, remember yourself. What is this? You know, and the person suddenly is pushed back into looking at the moment. So it's like this, that anytime you, you, you don't pay attention to like where you are, the surfboard on this manifestation becomes shaky. So you might not believe how much of knowledge is literally inner painting. It's literally an effort for the new engagement because in, on some level, nothing can be taught. How, how is the transmission of the teaching? I mean, sure, we can give names to objective phenomena. You know, we can force people to acknowledge certain names. But I'm telling you, it's as if like when I'm giving this talk to you, these talks, these words originate out of a sort of experiential passage of my life so far. And then I'm like, all right, this is how it looks, you know, and I'm sharing it. But I'm telling you that it's like, the words are double-sided. That means the one who speaks and the one who hears never actually see the same subject of discussion. They see the same symbol, but not the same subject. <clears throat> that means twins aren't clones, you know? <laughs> There is something very joyous in nature, and I think it's it has to do with when nature welcomes you, not you force yourself into it. If you notice anything that you, I, I let me call it like this, we'll, we can call it the authentic pace of the mind. Anything you, it's like anything that makes you forget how reality's complexity arises from simplicity, is the deception. Do you know? That means human beings are a living mystery. They're not just living in a mystery. They are the living mystery. We are it. You know? We are, we are the mind in the room. The earth is the matter in the room. <laughs> now this mind of ours is very crucial because, let me tell you, one of the most things that has shocked me in this life is the human body. I can tell you that sure, there is of course many metaphysical notions, many ways the mind can fathom the human structure in different contexts, but there's something about the physical body that it's still, for me there's there is a geometrical mystery to existence that experience seems to be an eternal answer to. That means the higher dimensions of this world are not linguistic, they're experiential. We got to literally become the worlds that we want to enter. And life is, is not just about written intelligence, guys. That means, I'll tell you this, do you think a human being can go on living in this life 
and not perceive patterns. As far as I'm concerned, everyone in society and civilization, we're pattern recognition. We're pattern recognizing creatures. We're like, oh, familiar. Oh, unfamiliar. Oh, familiar. Oh, unfamiliar. <laughs> that's, that's literally what's going on on some level. You know, that means anything that's a 50-50 automatically, guess what? You got to have faith if you want to see more happen. That's it. So when it comes to our inner realms, you know, because for me, language is like this technology that can infinitely stretch, but people are fighting for viewpoints of truth. You know how silly that is? You know that, how silly that is? That's kind of like saying, like, you put a tons of Lego pieces on the ground for let's say your future kids to play <laughs> and then your future kids are just fighting over one piece and you're like oh my god kids look at all the other pieces Do you know so in some sense people fighting over beliefs they're fighting over how their experience has extracted a chunk of sensory perception during an animate moment and snapshot snapshot it uh, I'm saying that wrong <laughs> snapshotted it you know you know how like you can take a screenshot on your phone your beliefs are screenshots of your inner realms bam <laughs> honestly like that's a, i think that's a nice way of saying it your inner realms are screenshots your beliefs your beliefs are screenshots of your inner realms come on guys that's that that deserves something <laughs> Yes, actually yes and no, because the pattern, if it's a human pattern, how can it transcend human culture, you know? But I can see that there are certain things that are happening that were happening before the human being opened its eyes. So John Moss, I agree with you in that sense, in regards to your comment in the chat section. You know, I think people underestimate the communication ability of the human being. When you go look at history, you find people attempting to speak to plants, speak to animals. I mean, speaking to human beings, that's everywhere. You know, but speaking to, for example, AI, sp <laughs> speaking to God, speaking to angels, speaking to demons, speaking to aliens. Do you see the mind is not comfortable? with what it has already seen. That means it's like our sight <clears throat> is... <clears throat> is a force, it's a process. <clears throat> so John Moss, um, I can see that you're saying just out of curiosity, would the audience like to hear me speak about um, a geometrical approach to higher dimensions or not? So uh, audience members, viewers can let me know in the chat section if they want me to you know, navigate the pilot, the talk a bit more towards geometry. <clears throat> because that, that changes the context. You see, geometry is an infinite game. That means don't, don't, it's like Midas. My, I don't know how many people know Midas from Greek mythology, but this was a person who touched everything and it became gold, King Midas. You see what I mean? Like this dude touched everything and it's gold, you know? That moment where he's kind of like, I mean, technically, <laughs> if he touched his own body, would it be gold? I don't know, this maybe. <clears throat> like if King Midas scratched his shoulder, could his shoulder suddenly be just chunk of gold? <laughs> oh, that's messed up. His whole hand would be destroyed in that sense. But anyways, anyways, I'll continue, guys. Nature is a movement, and you speak to it through the language of presence. And this language of presence is like the same way you hear people speak. It would be the same way you would witness thought emerging.
You see, guys, I am just sharing what I feel <clears throat> is a species waking up to how it is creating meaning in a system that is alive beyond what the human can extract as meaningful. So I'm telling you, me and you are suddenly realizing, like back in the day, that giant turtle where civilization was on. That's a suggestion of connecting with the world spirit. Now, what does that mean? That doesn't mean like, you know, what is that? God comes to you and say, oh, hey, God, how are you? You know, let's shake hands. You know, thanks for coming. You know, <laughs> it's not an archetypal relationship. It's actually very non-dual. So there's really two routes to it. Either you are still in silent and your mind reveals to you that where you think you is, is the prime mover. So you pretty much realize on the other side of your ego, everything is one motion. You discover the, I would say at that point, you will realize you're the, that, that would be when your unconscious is moving your conscious. You know, for example, in the New Age community, I remember that the, back in the day, there was the YouTube videos of this guy I would see. His name was, um, anyways, I'll, I'll, I won't say his name, but um, <clears throat> this man evidently was, in some sense, an extraterrestrial was speaking through him. And I was thinking, all right, even if there was the potential, for such a thing, the filter would be the guy's mind. Do you know, I remember giving a talk like a week ago about how matter and is like the language of higher dimensions, <clears throat> of higher dimensional space. So I will tell you that, trust me, a person, most people are not aware of their inner realms. And their inner realms, it's not like another world. You know, it, it's just that you're realizing that attention is standing before your personality. Anytime you realize that, you just you won't believe it. When you abide in just your presence, your everything heals. I mean, as much of it as it can. You just see the body no longer resist itself. Anytime a person is upset about anything, some part of your body is resisting itself. That means internal, like if, if a person is seeing an apocalypse, you think your stomach is not going to, you're not going to feel like this gut feeling or something, you know? It's like, imagine that movie, what was it called? Armageddon or something? Imagine meteor about to hit Earth. I mean, like something in your stomach is like, oh. <laughs> you know, everybody starts puking before the meteor hits. jokes but but anyways <laughs> I'm just saying the fact that your inner realms influence your objective realms don't think your objective realms are just influencing your inner realms your free will is pretty much how your physical reality is a glove for our for, for your presence and it's very easy that was the whole point of mantras guys by the way I don't know how many people know what a mantra is but I'm like just um, at the beginning, in, you, in when I was in the UK, I would say a lot of mantras. I might say it one at the end of this. <clears throat> but anyways, we have to have the ability to confront the unknown in front of our eyes and behind it. The unknown behind your eyes, you can't confront it until you become responsible for the space where matter is moving. So unless you're ready to experience yourself as uh, the presence of sight before what's in the sight, then I, I would say mysticism is not for the faint of heart. That means, listen, life is, I feel every person, um, your DNA is like, it's like a program right now. You know, it's strange. Maybe if somebody in the future is giving a talk, they might have experiences like the person's giving the talk, but they're also in a virtual reality moving and giving a talk. So imagine in the future, when somebody's giving a live stream, people are have like these goggles, virtual reality goggles on, and they're all in the in like a simulation. So right now, like people, how, how we're all in the chat section, let's say, and maybe like, I don't know, like give it 50 years or 100 years, it, it's probably people, the chat sections are going to become like digital environments. 
that means you see this society is becoming so uh, it's zooming in too much on the details of behavior without realizing that the motivation of life is creative I feel that intelligence really is being aware of options is it not that means I think the greatest wisdom is the recognition that it's a dynamic process. It's not like a math exam where you just give a certain value to the X variable and ta-da, it's done. You know, it, <laughs> you know, you find the missing link and it's done. No, no, no. It, it's more like, again, I say like horse riding or like piloting or like driving. You know, that means even the word poetically, they, some people say, what are you, you know... Uh, how are you driven in this life, you know? Like, what is your drive? Where is your direction? You know, do you even see a direction? Uh, or do you want to bask in the freedom of potential? There's some people where Jordan Peterson... I don't know what it is, guys. We have, uh, I think, our inner realms. We felt betrayed by our inner realms. I think that's what happened. I think at some point, we forgot that it's okay to be multidimensional as a species. And now the pattern's resurfacing. And that multidimensionality means that not only the self moves the awareness, the awareness moves the self. You know, that means in your dreams, is your body moving to cause your dream? I mean, of course, your heart is beating in your life. <clears throat> but the free will in your dream is literally like... You know how Elon Musk said that when he was young he was afraid of darkness and then he realized it's just an absence of photons when he realized it's an absence of photons he was not afraid and i am telling you you might suddenly realize all human behavior to have a geometrical meaningless but still animate translation let me tell you, worlds are opening up. That's the whole point of human beings being born. You know, and nature pushes them. Nature's like, all right, I got you here after four billion years. You better do something. <laughs> there is a certain level of simple care. That means you can't be a chaotic person if you don't know what the order is. Like, what are you then? How are you being chaotic then? You know, you can't be an ordered person unless you know what the chaos is. Do you see? And sometimes I've thought, why is it that so, some people get lost in the second place mindset? You see it in movies, like the poor guy tries, but he's still second place. It's because that guy hasn't realized when he makes another person the focus of his life, he's second place. When you make yourself the focus of your life, you become first place. But, but, if you can then make yourself and realize its simultaneity with the world, then desire becomes confused. The, ar the archetypal, ar archetype bound mind, the egoic construct kind of, in some sense, it's like, whoa, 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 whoa. Do I want what I want for me or is me the world and I want what's for the world? So after some point, there becomes an inseparability of your own existence in your own individual bubble and the greater bubble that you're in being, whether you know it or not, an influence it. Do you know, I, I, I kind of, there was, uh, in 2016, uh, I just, I, I was in, uh, where was it? Chislago, Italy, in a hotel, and I was on, like, the balcony. It wasn't even a balcony. It was just, like, 
this p place for flowers, but I, I like it was on the third floor and I was exhausted. So I went outside this little place they had and I, my feet were like inches away from the edge, the edge of the building. And I'm just like, kind of like having a quiet cigarette there. And it was just, I don't know. I felt sad that night, that night. It was just like, you know, it's like weather, you know, it's like some days it's raining. What are you going to do? <laughs> so I felt this sorrow and then that sorrow suddenly it was as if like, how can I tell you? It's like, you know, it's, it, there's a way of hatred where you're hating, for example, others, like evil outside. You're like, why? Why is the world so fucked up? Like, there's a sort of hatred there. But then there's a hatred of your own <laughs> incompetence in the past. Have you noticed it's always easier to judge your past than your future? Because the future, you don't know what the potential is. So most people, they just use their past to judge themselves. I'm like, that's not complex. Everybody's using the past to judge themselves. Use your, the potential of your future. That means novelty is one of the most powerful and revolutionizing worlds uh, ad infinitum. Words ad infinitum. It's that one word that always will remain. The concept of it. The importance of it. And so in that moment, I was having this sort of inner cycle of, I would say, like, literally, it was as if my consciousness was like whack-a-mole with every memory I remembered of my past, you know? That means imagine like this line of film, like imagine this film is being played, but now the present moment is angry at what the past couldn't do. So then you kind of feel like you're, you're like you're every every thought that any it's kind of like when you don't your emotions are multidimensional. You know what that means? That means you could be angry about something now, then somebody tells you something, you remember something, then the sense of self of you from that memory is being simultaneously here with the anger. So that sense of self feels angry. That means your emotions kind of dictate what you remember. <clears throat> We're not just objective and subjective creatures, you know? I'm just handling those dimensions because those are required for, you know, for now. Think of it this way. The more uh, stronger and internally stronger our civilization becomes, the more it will advance. <clears throat> the less it will fear the inevitable, because the inevitable is the inevitable. It's like, well, okay, all right, we're, we're temporary physical bodies here, sure. But while we're not temporary, does it not make sense to at least attempt, attempt what an advanced civilization would be like? And that would mean that people have to start looking at their world in new ways. And that is a privilege that if you are unfortunate in your childhood, the priv that privilege is taken away. Do you know what that means? Imagine a child being born and they love their family. The family is their what they know, who they know. And so the child suddenly opens up to certain information that is out of the context of his family. You know, so what he is familiar and used to suddenly is being found foreign. Do you know? So, so what I'm telling you, what that means is that on some level, the purpose of life is not just knowing the truth. It's like, okay, you, knew, you, you found the truth. What then? You know, still something has to function. So human beings, they shouldn't just search, uh, like we shouldn't just be scholars. We should also be... Uh, uh, how would I say it? Um, the burning beacons of romanticism in, in the future. What that means is human behavior has a complexity, uniqueness to it that it's timeless. <clears throat> that means it's like comparing the laugh of someone from like back in the day in medieval times to the laugh of someone now. There is a genuine presence to that to laughter that it's like you know it's like a release 
And I feel that that's what we find in nature. Things go towards complexity, they stay there for some time, and then they're released back into simplicity. So I feel that we are, by the way we live, directing our collective species, and there is no downside in the sense that simple child grows into some complex creature to certain ranges, and then the complexity returns. That means it's like that moment where the caterpillar is walking to go into the cocoon and, and the friends of the caterpillar are like, yo man, don't go, you'll change. You'll never come back. We won't know who you are. You know, and the, and, and the caterpillar is like, don't worry, I'll see you on the other side because all the caterpillars were becoming butterflies. They were just freaking out before they were in the cocoon. Do you know? And that's kind of the experience of human life where you freak out because you have not realized the journey so far. Mindfulness means that the day you can hold your memories as precious jewels are the day where you have found your diamond mind. That means most people are acquainted in civilization 1.0 with dishonoring their minds. That means the human being does something that they on some level know it's messed up, and then they continue, and then this builds up this savageness where there is, there is this guilt. Let me tell you, in a dualistic system, there's always symmetrical guilt. You know what that means? That means before the bad activity, the good is being considered. Before the good activity, the bad is being considered. The duality, each side of it is the precondition to the other, depending on where you look at it. You know? And I don't know, you know, you, you can ask, like, what's the value of speech? Why should human beings talk? Why not all just silently, like ants in the forest, just go about our business? Because we can speak, we should. Not because we can speak, we can others aren't, we shouldn't. You know? And honestly, guys, just, just consider it. I mean, think about it. I'm, I'm Mr. Within is here. He's like, all right, advanced civilization. All right, let's sing that song. <laughs> but really, what we can advance now is only communication. That means if there was an aerial view from an extraterrestrial position, it would be like, all right, the more these creatures communicate, the more they seem intelligent. The less they communicate, the, the less the intelligent is, intelligence is there. You see what it is? It's like you're pushed on stage. The perfect, perfect analogy. Conscious, conscious existence is like an experiencer, a witness is pushed. Eye, sight is pushed into the change of form. So the stage is you open your eyes in it. Birth is an awakening. And if awakening is defined by change, any change of what is seen is another awakening. Do you know what I mean? <clears throat> so guys, uh, John Moss says speech has rhythm and movement. Yeah, speech is, uh, I'll tell you, I was shocked to figure out back in the day, people spoke in verse. You know what that means? That means there wasn't just the physical body, there wasn't just the body's energy levels, there was also the rhythm that the person finds themselves in. And I'll tell you guys, sometimes in my inner realms, I've envisioned of potential parallel like sci-fi futures to the earth. And when I've envisioned that, In one vision, I saw the 
self transformation i pretty much right now you know what's happening humanity's future self if it endures is going to be a god in the making now what does that mean that means it's kind of strange but you know how a, a, a person has like their parents qualities genetically and even maybe behaviorally It's like in the attempt of human beings to control their environment, the evolution of control is godhood, is it not? That means whether you believe or not, believe it or not, Western society is trying to make the entertainment industry and just every future technology, it's coming to satisfy the person. That's the incredible thing about business guys where it's not just enough to have a product this product has to be introduced to the world that's the fa fascinating thing there's this whole marketing dimension to the journeyer and that marketing for human beings is self-marketing what, what does that mean that means every day you look in the mirror you're getting a thought an opinion on who you are that is like the, the switch of the attention You know, there was a time where uh, <coughs> excuse me. What can I say about that which moves words? I can say that in the motion, in every conscious moment, I feel there is co-expression in two dimensions of being. I feel mental activity lingers. I feel mental activity, uh, it lingers in the sense that if two people argue in a room and they leave, there is like imprints of that in the room. I, I, I've considered this because in, in uh, it's strange, kind of like in regards to metaphysical context and in regards to uh, <clears throat> gatherings of souls and whatnot in, in, in those circles, you know, where the person it's, it, it, you know, I've, I've, you know, I've spoken to a person who felt they were eternal and I've spoken to a person who felt eternity couldn't exist and I've noticed I am dwelling as the watcher. And this watcher is your mind. So, you know what's strange? <clears throat> Where if in on the Sistine Chapel there is a picture of man and God, let me let me find this for the audience which Michelangelo drew, and guys, drawing on a ceiling is next level. You know what I mean? Like, poor guy had to probably climb down the stairs every two minutes, you know? <laughs> <clears throat> Michelangelo drew it. Um, I mean, I'm pretty sure everybody's seen it, but maybe new generations haven't, you know.
there we go. So um, anyone listening, this is the picture I was talking about. You see there's a gap between man and God's fingers, you know. This gap is the veil of thought, okay? And I'm saying that this gap is the mind. And the mind is the only tool. that can bridge that gap between the known and the unknown. The breath is keeping something here that is through a singular mode appearing multidimensional to itself. So anyways, guys, this is the picture. I'm gonna put it here and I'll put it here. Actually, I'll put something else there. And I wanted to show you how the place looks. Uh, there we go. So guys, this is the Sistine Chapel in Italy, okay? And uh, you see where God and man are like, that's a very important moment. <clears throat> and Michelangelo drew this. That means if Michelangelo was alive, people for till the end of time would listen to his podcast. <laughs> There we go. So that's the Sistine Chapel. So, um, yeah, guys, these are the pictures. Um, let me see. So welcome everyone, everyone who's new to the chat. Um, I'm a, I'm a film school graduate education wise from graduate from Toronto film school. But in regards to all the things that I'm telling you, if you know this, I am sharing experiences. You know, Galileo has this saying, he says, you can't teach anyone anything. You can, you can make them, uh, what's, the, what's the full quote? You can't teach anyone anything. You can only make them realize it within themselves, something like that. What does that mean? That means I realize that I have access to my eyes. So in that sense, we are in some sense all, are, are all an autodidact, you know? We're all kind of like, we, we, you are, are you not taught by yourself? Isn't it yourself that's interpreting the other? Do you know? I can tell you that w the way I've kind of seen it is that I've throughout life, through certain experiences, noticed, noticed certain shifts and found a way to not identify 
with the phenomena of my own mind. I watch it. I can use language to speak. But it doesn't mean that I'm going around throughout the day, everything is just like, just sentences running, you know? It's, it's just when, if your attention chooses to, I will tell you that the greatest, the secret to all skill is the navigation of attention. And then there is the will, you know? So in some sense, we're in a world all trying to kind of understand each other's through things that are similar, like a common language, but we're different beings. So you tell me, if somebody was te teaching painting, do you think two students would learn the same? No. So it, the concept of learning is not for you to copy something else and think that that's power. It's about understanding what the greatest people in that field were looking at. It's about ev everything is about what you're seeing. Have you noticed? We're creatures of sight. So what does that mean? That means being aware of what the environment is before you consider yourself something. <clears throat> you see what I'm saying? And of course, guys, I'm, I'm a kind of, like I'm a writer. You got to realize this. I, I have ideas of my own. Uh, a lot of these talks, I'm, I'm kind of showing parallels, you know. You know, painters use many colors to paint, you know. Some things I share with you, for example, Civilization 2.0, that is a very, that's an idea that um, some ideas you know, you just know that they are important. You know, if you watch these talent shows that are on YouTube, you will notice something remarkable about some singers. Some singers that go on stage, their attention is on the audience and they sing. But if you notice the great singers, at some point in their performance, their eyes close and they are left there with the raw emotion. And so talent is like the person has seen the phenomena in a way where it has authorized them access. Talent is how attention opens a new dimension of expression. So guys, I'll give you one more look at the Sistine Chapel, you know, in Italy. It's fascinating. Artwork on a building connects for the first time a physical structure to the philosophy of man. You know? <clears throat> so the Sistine Chapel is the most philosophical building ever made, you know, one of them at least. You know, it's like, this is the cool thing, guys. I think before there is a level of identification, before a person <clears throat> really knows who they are, if it's kind of like saying before a, 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 they psych, psychologists say by the age of, what is it, 12 to 14, where the individuality of the child kind of develops. The child becomes an individual to itself. That means it realizes its own weight. 
<clears throat> so before, before that age, what kind of state of mind is the child in? And you can say it is in a state of mind where the mind has not found that it needs to control itself. So what that means is most people, when they're born, you're being moved by life. So the psychology comes with a sort of dependence on the gentleness of the movement of life. But suddenly when the intensities of life become harsh, it's kind of like an evolution of the game of the psychology. <clears throat> that means when you were a kid, maybe like you were fighting in the in recess. So that's the thing. I'm saying that, I mean, Hegel kind of spoke, I got to bring this up, guys, because you can say when Hegel kind of spoke about the internal object, that was a way of saying that an object is made of particles. So what is an internal object made for, made from? <clears throat> now, you can say that Terence McKenna spoke about the meme. Richard Dawkins has spoken about a meme, but we are pretty much considering that if we are an idea behind our eyes, that is that Hegel, like you can say Hegel, this philosopher was looking at this, he's like, all right, so behind my eyes, let's say I am some, some design, not something that I can hold, but some, some, some shape, some, some, some things there behind my eyes, you know, that's more than just the physical reality. That means if you're aware of your imagination, that's a more of an advanced level than people who are not aware that the mind can, in some sense, in a parallel way, deviate reality to create potentials. You know, guys, I'm telling you this, there's some questions in life that no one can ask from you. And when you ask yourself or intuitively nature brings you into that experience, you will realize that after your whole dependence in this lifetime on subjective phenomena about validity, it's the experience that's moving, not the language. That means the moment we think we are thoughts, it's like, Man thinking he is AI, he's thinking he's his creation. Do you know? That's what I'm what kind of saying. There's, um, <clears throat> I don't know, it's an experience. Nobody needs to worry about the right, having the right idea or the wrong idea. It's, it's about attention. Attention, a mode of it. So you can say subjects are a con part of the content of the moment. Right now when I'm looking at this, like for example, like this cup with like a little bit of orange juice in it. <laughs> so when I'm looking at this cup, you know, I'm calling it a cup. These words that I'm saying, how are they more than just sound? How are they more than just sound? Do you see? Because there's, there, it's as if there's a space that's hearing and then moving. Do you know? I, I don't know how to say it. It's like, it's animate before linearity. So it's like, <clears throat> you know, God doesn't wear a watch. <laughs> Time. exists for the attention that's in the room. 
Most people depend, let me tell you what it is. Human beings throughout their life, imagine their life experiences. This isn't on mute, is it? Okay, no. So human beings in life, guys, your experiences sculpt you, whether you believe it or not. But what you experience in this life, it's like it's like an exchange. Like something from that experience is added to your perception, but also something is taken. Do you know? That means it's like talking with someone and then, you know, you learn something new, but you got tired. You know? <laughs> <clears throat> so I'm saying... All I'm saying is we have lost ourselves <clears throat> in our expression as its effect. And free will is a suggestion of causing new things. So we find 8 billion creatures on a rock in the middle of nowhere opening their eyes in a system that is already preconditioning behaviors, models of behavior that will develop in people's minds. So what that means is the value system. When you look at any system, anywhere, anything in life, any situation you're in, I feel like a very interesting question to ask is where is the value? Where's the value of the moment? And th there's two th components to this, okay? This value is not a desire. This value is what is worth the moment. I don't know how to, how to say that. Like, You know, it, it, it's like vision is the art of seeing that which is invis invisible to others. Jonathan Swift says this, I believe. Vision is the art of seeing that which is invisible to others. Now, what does that mean? That means if there is something that is invisible to others, the visibility is not it. And I'm saying that we're kind of at most, at most, it's like imagine hundreds of years past, now the same way the secular society was trying to convert the religious irrationality to rationality, religious fundamentalism into rationality. In the future, imagine life becoming such a transcendental place that it's as if we need to convert the secular into the sort of transcendental mindset. So I'm telling you, it's a pattern echoing. It's a performance uh, on a stage, not made by your hands, but your mind is watching and not as an audience member. <clears throat> so I would say, it's like, how can I be a temporary being if I don't have a meaning for eternity? How, how could temporality have meaning? Do you know, it's like when space is meaningless, you're like, gosh, what do I do with the matter? It's meaningless too. <laughs> but that's the thing. We are an evolutionary opportunity to realize that we're not just here to find meaning. We are here to create meaning. But as you go to create meaning in your individual life, your individuality, again, is codependent with your collective. What does that mean? That means sometimes a person doesn't know what their values are. They're just walking in the world as a new, new face. And then what happens is they see how others are facing each other. They see how people are facing the world. Every person I have seen, I can know when there is something on their mind. It's very easy. It's literally like a phone or like a computer with a lot of applications open and the comp computer is slowing down, you know? 
And the issue is that the human being, the piloting of the inner realms, <clears throat> sometimes it, it can, it's not smooth for people. That means think of it this way. Think as if everything you touch, every movement echoes. It echoes in your memory. And the memory is like this vast field, as if your consciousness is, your awareness is the sky, and all your memories are clouds in it. They come and go. I'm going to share with you guys a story of Rumi. Pretty much Rumi is sitting by a fountain, he's reading a book, you know, it's a science book. He's in his, let's say, late 20s reading his science book 700 years ago um, by a fountain. And out of nowhere, this very enlightened kind of spiritual wild, wild man and traveler suddenly is traveling there and sees Romy and comes up to him and says, Hey kid, what are you reading? You know, but he says it with an intensity, you know, like the, as if his, his you know, inner realms are more, more intense than his outer realms. So the person is one of those person, people that they don't, they're not afraid of external phenomena. They're more afraid of inner phenomena though, you know, <clears throat> that can happen. You know, it's like a person can love their mind or they can fear their mind. I, I say honor it, whatever it is, you know? That means at some point realizing the darkest hour, dawn arises. And the nightingale, nightingale feels the warmth of the sun on its wings, you know? So anyways, anyways, attention is here now. After the ultimate realization of the inner realms, your inner realms still are where they are. Do you know? It's like a person can close their eyes. It's like dream anything, sweetheart. <laughs> you know, but then you'll open your eyes and you see the world is still where it is. So the thing is, like, you know how they say be it when you when in Rome, be Roman? It's like there's an idiom that, that's like that. So similarly, it's, it's kind of like when you're in matter, be a materialistic entity. When you're in your inner realms, don't try to be a materialistic entity. It'll, 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 it'll disturb. Like literally the antenna, it's like you're moving the antenna line. You know, the human being is that there is a receptive space. For me, I think of it this way. When you download a file, you know, it comes on the memory of your computer. You just drop it on your desktop or whatever. <clears throat> so it's kind of like that desktop is the inner space. And the file that's being downloaded, it gets downloaded by attention, being in sync with the experiential rhythm that is not from your individual identification in this life. It's from your uh, pretty much how the universal mind has pushed you into this world. And what that means is the peak of evolution is the inconceivable. And after you're inconceivable, what is left? If you're here on earth, that means uh, either the inconceivable was boring or you're taking a vacation from the inconceivable. Because you got to think about it. The human being knows conception. You, 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 you saw the show as the human being. There's nothing really to fear. You know, human life, you know, you see it. The, thing, the fear arises in regards to how much behind your eyes you have given yourself a permission to be. Do you know? That means when I could say that when my inner realms were different than the outer realms, uh, you know, th that's, that was a point where I was super shy. When my inner realms and outer realms 
in some sense, I realized they have always been beside one another. Then there was no longer an identification with one side of this spectrum. That means all those poor souls thinking they're introverted, or extroverted, before those concepts, what were you? You know, you see you're in your presence. It's simple. You're like a simple, your eternity is simple, your temporality is complex. You know? <laughs> and so, like for example, guys, this picture was so epic I had to share because it's fish. You know? This all, you know what I mean? <laughs> it's like... You're feeling coy and you see fish and it becomes coy fish. <laughs> You know, the artist drew it with fish. And that show, what was it called? From Studio Ghibli, this profound Japanese animation production company. Incredible work. Um, they, in some sense, had this thing, Princess Mononoke or something, where the soul of the world was walking, you know? Or its head was cut off or something. Like, profound archetypes. Usually, usually guys, if it was me and somebody asked me, who are the most Japanese storytellers in the world? Uh, sorry, who are the most advanced uh, storytellers in the world? I would say the Japanese. Sorry, that sentence came <laughs> You know what I mean, though? Japanese stories have such complexity and sometimes entrance into multidimensionality. For example, even you can see this echo culturally in Akira Kurosawa's work. Because filmmakers around the world, they're cultural beings. They're looking at a world and they're like, all right, what do I see about it? And what am I inspired towards? And it's like the, the vision of their ability to see something and shift it into another value is pretty much like, <clears throat> you know, the ego behind the director, behind the director's eyes, you know. I, by nature, I can tell you that complexity, how can I tell you? Like, there's a level of simplicity of how a being is being that you can't comment on. You're just it. Have you noticed? Like, there's just, I, that's why I say presence, presence. Now, when this presence is just being itself, literally, there is no space or time to have to be a thought or anything else. So you are just presence watching. And then after a while, you'll notice your thoughts are observable. So you start observing your thoughts. That means any moment throughout the day when an idea comes, you'll suddenly notice it. It's you, you might not believe it, but I've had certain moments where I've been in a room and suddenly a thoughts come to my mind. And I've said it and somebody's gone in shock and he's like, I was about to do that. Do you know? And it was, it was, do you know what I mean? It was, it was a sort of as if noticing, imagine it right now as I'm speaking in some subtler dimension, if there's a view that it's all like geometric shapes, do you know? In some sense, science is a very gentle geometrical interpretation of reality. But, you know, I mean, mathematics is a language, guys. You know, but it's a language of abstraction over our, our abstraction. So you can say mathematics is a language inside a language inside a language. Or you can say just inside, it, it's a language inside a language, let's say. But it can also be a language inside a language inside a language. So what does that mean? It's a trans way you're translating the world. Just like how many languages there are, the word can be translated in all those languages like you go on Google. So similarly, it's like that. <clears throat> it's a dimension of perception. The mind, I feel, is uh, on another... Like, you know how in the movie Matrix, Neil was seeing like 
like, you know, once he became like the chosen one, he looked at things and he saw them as light. He saw Agent Smith as light and code. That means he got access to the simplicity that was even leading to the complexity that he was confronting. So it was as if you can say Neil, when he became the chosen one, he realized the whole world is the domain of his consciousness. <clears throat> but there is this theory that Neil was never the chosen one and it was Smith, you know. I'm pretty much just wondering, guys, how civilization is going to evolve from a character in a story into a collective experience. I feel that maybe we uh, tightened our shoelaces of human knowledge too firmly. You know, I feel that there should be diction there should be so many dictionaries and new words being created on every day. But the fact that new words aren't being created on a massive level means that human beings are not wondering about potentials to the moment. And I remember there was something I kind of, this was, I, I can say this is going to be uh, the core of the talk here. That spirit of the world, that logos the ancient Greeks saw, that will of God that the monotheists saw, that uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, presence of the gods that the polytheists saw, you know, that objective realm that the pantheists saw, you know. After some point, you will suddenly see every phenomena is like an instrument. So it's like that tree right now, imagine it's a violinist. It's as intelligent as a violinist, you know? But on some design level, there's a level of core observance of design that there is no character or story yet. That is the pure geometrician. That's, that's when geometry uh, finds you. And anytime geometry finds you, a symbol becomes your your how can I tell you, You're, you will get echoes of a certain symbol in your inner realms, do you know? I don't know, I think I remember speaking about the prophets of starlight, but I, I was saying something in the sense that, like, I don't know if I ever spoke about it or I just wrote it down, but it was this idea that, in I, I've said that language is a, language, a geometry is the next great language of all languages. Now, I've also said that in the inner realms, geometry is animate in unknown ways. That means I've had moments where somebody has spoken and literally every word that they have said hasn't translated into an image. It has just translated into pure geometrical form. That means if you really zoom in on a painting, you don't see it. See it. When you zoom out, you see the painting. You know, and so the reason I'm saying piloting, because through, as civilizations rise and fall, they kind of counteract each other as if the earth has a memory. So the next civilization somehow has a sense of the past mistake. <clears throat> it's a huge responsibility because it's like this. It's like the more information that comes to the person, their storage, 
let's say you, you, you are some biological data processing <coughs> entity. Now, we can say, sure, we can consider there's a storage length, and the storage length is from the moment you wake up to the time you fall asleep. You can consider it's as if the moment you wake up, like right now I'm speaking to you, what is present here? Do you think an object is here? Do you think a subject is here? Do you think matter is making sounds without patterns? The world is as alive as our whole moment is being our mind. <clears throat> that's, the, that's the thing. That's why compassion is a win-win. Whether you think of reality in a singular dimension or multidimensional. It's a presence, and that presence is too instantaneous to be the shape, so it appears if in shape as the mover of shape. <clears throat> that means our minds can never die, but our bodies were born to. Our eyes are rooted like the roots of a tree in dimensions that are not observable even by the scope of our linguistic technologies. <clears throat> that means language, it might be a very unique thing that this creature is doing speaking, but at the same time, when you look at the, the freedom of choice in space, that, that chooser, the moment something moves, <clears throat> what is more divine? It's like these science fiction stories I tell you, there are characters that I have conceived from my mind, and it's kind of like me feeling what mind am I a conception of, only to realize that the character in my story has no way of knowing or even needing to know who, who the storyteller is. So what does that mean? That means whether you personify the cosmos or not, whether you see a face to it or not, it's an intelligent activity. And the safest, I think, most intellectual route is to say, be, be aware where the fence of our acknowledgement is. <clears throat> that means, like, for example, why are so many people against racism? They're against racism. It's because one person's inner realm is not caring for another person's outer realm or their inner realm. Do you know? What does that mean? That means... One person, from only their point of view, is convinced what they see is true, so they are oblivious to all the potential ways that that other person could be alive. It's, it's self-ignorance, and that's the issue. It's something that the being does that causes it. Some things, before you do anything, they're already set into motion. They're like the life of your world. <clears throat> So I feel human life is like catching waves and these waves and maybe like, I don't know, a couple hundred years where reality is attempting to become more sci-fi. <laughs> it's going to be higher speed. That means when you look at like Beethoven, yeah, he did some nice things on the piano, but all the human beings that came after him also, each one of them did their own unique thing. <clears throat> and it's as if kind of Beethoven realizing that the musician dies, but the music doesn't. And that's the privilege of the lifetime. That your conscious mind is the gift. Imagine so many people waiting to try to open the gift of their lifetime, only to realize they're inside the gift box. You're like, whoa, I was in there all the whole time, you know? So some people like getting presents and some people realize themselves in the present. Yeah.
So anyways, uh, thanks for listening, everyone. <clears throat> if there's anyone, any, anything anyone wants to discuss, now is a good time. I can share my opinion on it or whatever. You know, if not, um, the evening has been good. You know, guys, I thought of doing something I haven't done before in these talks, and I was like, why not? Let's do it. And so I looked up, I pretty much typed in Cherokee wisdom quotes. <laughs> and so I came to this website where there's a bunch of sayings from, you know, you can say, um, I feel like these are important words. Maybe they can open new avenues of perception. So I'm just going to go into a code tunnel of um, Cherokee words of wisdom, literally the title of what I'm reading. <laughs> so this was spoken by the principal of the Cherokee Nation, Chief Chad Smith, in 2001. The Cherokee legacy is that we are a people who face adversity, survive, adapt, prosper, and excel. And to fulfill this legacy, we must ask the questions, where will we be as people 5, 10, 50, or 100 years from now? Do we brag about our full blood ancestor or do we brag about our Indian grandchildren? Do we live in the past or do we focus on the future? Is being Cherokee a novelty or a way of life? Is being Cherokee a heritage or a future? Our ancestors who walk the grounds of this Capitol building resoundingly cry, don't forget the legacy we passed on. Don't let it lapse, pass it on, stronger and stronger to your children. Let the Cherokee language laugh, speak, and sing again. Let our history be known and discussed. Live by our wisdom. Don't let us die as a people. If you do, then all our sacrifice will be for nothing, and you will lose things And you will lose things that fulfill your life. Do you know, guys, that's, that's a level of adversity where you're literally, you're fighting to keep the voice of your ancestors alive. You know, it's only to realize, like, uh, we can totally, as a civilization, build an advanced AI that preserves and records all languages or something, you know. What the hell Silicon Valley doing? <laughs> <laughs>
I blame Silicon Valley for not bringing the solution enough, <laughs> quicker enough. Yeah. Honestly, guys, there was a reason. Like, if there was the, an idea of the concept of, let's say, past lives. Like, if I was a Buddhist, I would totally entertain the notion that in a past life I was a scribe. I was probably like a dude that's like, oh my God, I saw something you might be forgotten by history. Let's write it on a rock <laughs> <laughs> or a leaf. You know, I'm joking, guys. Anyways, let's continue into the quote tunnel. The next thing I'm going to read for you was written by, was said by David Epina, Yurok artist, Sacramento, CA. Being Indian is mainly in your heart. It's a way of walking with the earth instead of upon it. Wow, well said. A lot of the history books talk about us Indians in the past tense, but we don't plan on going anywhere. We have lost so much, but the thing that holds us together is that we all belong to and are protectors of the earth. That's the reason for us being here. Mother Earth is not a resource. She is a... She is an hireloom. And I have never heard that word before. Guys, just give me a second. Pretty much means queen or something, right? Just a second, guys. The thing is loading. Let me see what this word means. Jesus Christ. Hireloom. A valuable object that has belonged to a family for several generations. Oh, okay, like, okay. That means it's pretty much the uh, football field that the future generations are going to be on and we're destroying it as we're playing on the field, you know? Anyways. <clears throat> You know, life is not just about the way you extract it into intelligible patterns. Let's, let's say uh, experience dash linguistic kind of patterns, experientially linguistic patterns. That means we're not just attributing symbols to objects technically the moment we project the symbol where we, our mind is also experiencing being it so the way that if you notice anytime a human being judges another person they remember their own words more than the other person may that means there has been moments where literally like there would be some chaos that would appear out of the nowhere out of nowhere and i would just not engage it and the chaos would suddenly like I have nothing to engage. And there was times where I would fight the chaos and that's never good. So don't fight fire with fire. Ask the fire why it's burning. Or let wait until it extinguishes itself, you know? That means we, we have to be more intelligent than our ancestors or what are we doing? <laughs> Semi Seminole Elder says, The strength of our future lies in the protecting of our past. Thunder rolling in the mountains, Chief Joseph Nez Perce. The earth was created by the assistance of the sun, and it should be left as it was. The country was made with no lines of demarcation, and it's no man's business to divide it. I see the 
color whites all over the country gaining wealth. And I see the desire to give us lands which are worthless. I see, I see the whites all over the country gaining wealth and I see the desire to give us lands which are worthless. The earth and myself are of one mind. Perhaps you think the Creator sent you here to dispose of us as you see fit. If I thought you were sent by the Creator, I might be, I might he induced to, I might be induced to think you had a right to dispose of me. Do not misunderstand me, but understand me fully with reference to my affection for the land. Guys, this is thunder rolling in the mountains. Chief Joseph from Ness Purse saying this. All right, I'm just going to read it once again. The earth was created by the assistance of the sun, and it should be left as it was. The country was made with no lines of demarcation, and it's no man's business to divide it. I see the whites all over the country gaining wealth, and I see the desire to give us lands which are worthless. The earth and myself are of one mind. Perhaps you think the Creator sent you here to dispose of us as you see fit. If I thought you were sent by the Creator, I might be induced to think you had, the right, you had a right to dispose of me. Do not misunderstand me, but understand me fully with reference to my affection for the land. I never said the land was mine to do with as I choose. The one who has a right to dispose of it is the one who created it. I claim a right to live on my land and accord you the privilege to return to yours. Brother, we have listened to your talk coming from our father, the great white chief in Washington, and my people have called upon me to reply to you. The winds which pass through these aged pines, we hear the moaning of departed ghosts. And if the voice of our people could have been heard, that act would never have been done. But alas, though they stood around, they could neither be seen nor heard. Their tears fell like drops of rain. I hear my voice in the depths of the forest, but no answering voice comes back to me. All is silent around me. My words must therefore be few. I can now say no more. He is silent, for he has nothing to answer when the sun goes down. Wow. History is intense, guys. Thunder rolling in the mountains, Chief Joseph Ness Purse also says, Our fathers gave us many laws which they had learned from their fathers. They told us to treat all men as they treated us, that we should never be the first to break a bargain, that it was a disgrace to tell a lie, that we should speak only the truth. We were taught to believe that the Great Spirit sees and hears everything that he never forgets, this I believe and all my people believe the same. So you see, guys, we have people who have relationships with our, their inner realms that is metaphorically or archetypally, archetypally kind of like their world. So you see, a way of communicating with your world is, believe it or not, how your mind is projecting it. <clears throat> and it's very intense. Strong people. The Cherokee people are very strong people. Co Cochise Ch Chiricahua Apache. And excuse me if I'm saying the name right, but I'm probably saying the name wrong. Yeah. <laughs> so wars are fought to see who owns the land, but in the end it possesses man. Who dares says who dares say he owns it? Is he not buried beneath it? When you're when you're a person who belongs to a community, you have to know who you are. You have to know oh sorry, this is someone else's quote. Charlotte Black Elk. Oglala Siu. When you're a person who belongs to a community, you have to know who you are. You have to know who your relatives are, and as a tribe, we have to know where we came from. So that makes sense that a language is based on the common values and for most people, the more ancient the incident in history, the more easier to accept, you know? That means if we wanted to have the same, same intensity and scrutinization of the abstraction of religious or metaphysical ideologies, it, we would have the same scrutinization in history's accuracy. 
So we see history is not 100% accurate. They say history is written by uh, the winners. Do you know how many libraries were destroyed? Do you know how many ideas have tried to literally devour human knowledge? We have to protect it. Scribes are defending uh, uh, knowledge from the jaws of time, you know? That's, and in these quotes, we see the importance of passing the lineage. That people, whoever they are, whatever they are, you're allowed to exist. And you're also allowed to express, but because civilization is a bit like a fax machine, <laughs> you know, we find ourselves paying attention to the inefficient, not realizing every moment we have paid attention to the inefficient. We could have just paid attention to the efficient. That's it. Your attention is not enslaved. That's why free will is here. Free will means you don't need a backup system. You are the dawn bringer of your own sky of meaning. <clears throat> Wars are fought to see who owns the land. Oh, I read this. Charlotte Black Elk says, when you're a person who belongs to the community, I read this too. Anonymous. Should I read it? All right, let's see what anon. I mean, that's too anonymous. Okay, I'll say it. I think it's interesting. So I have no idea who this quote is. Literally, the website says it's from anonymous, but it says, "Marriage among my people was like traveling in a canoe. The man sat in front and paddled the canoe. the The woman sat in the stern, but she steered." Wow. Wow! 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 Why is why is like modern TV not not looking into this stuff, you know? Guys, I'm going to post this in, in the live stream. Whoever you are, take this to the ears of your tribe. <laughs> you can say it's a Cherokee proverb or something. Cheyenne says, a nation is not conquered until the hearts of its women are on the ground. Then it is done, no matter how brave its warriors nor how strong its weapons. Wow. That means we have to protect the gentleness of the feminine grace that is an archetype for how nature has a gentler way it can do the action. Anything you've done in your life, you could have done it 50% gentler. Or whatever amount of percentage gentler. You can even do it more intense, you know. I tend to let, my, when I give these talks, my, when my emotions naturally arise, you know, I just, I'm like, all right, let's, let's go with what's happening, you know. <clears throat> Ginali Lee Cherokee <clears throat> says, have patience. All things change in due time. Wishing cannot bring autumn glory or cause winter to cease. Hopi, H-O-P-I, says, Lose your temper and you lose a friend. Lie and you lose yourself. Wow. Cherokee wisdom, guys, is like, definitely, I, I agree, it's the voice of nature. Sioux, S-I-O-U-X, says, with all things and in all things, we are relatives. Luther Standing Bear, Teten Siu says, Kinship with all creatures of the earth, sky, and water was a real and active principle. Kinship with all creatures of the earth. Guys, that, that, that's what I'm talking about. We got to decide to communicate with the nature of our world by getting an awareness to the nature of our minds that are in some sense where the works, that are the center of 
of like attention is the center of gravity of sensory perception, you know? Kinship with all creatures of the earth, sky, and water was a real and active principle. And so close did some of the Lakotas come to their feathered and furred friends that in true brotherhood they spoke a common tongue. That means we can say Druidry back in the day in certain pantheistic circles was a way where nature's voice and man's ears were inseparable. That means everything is being everything so it can change. Luther's standing bear continues, the animals had rights, the right of man's protection, the right to live, the right to multiply, the right to freedom, and the right to man's indebtedness. Poland, guys, guys, koyo, koya, why, ma, opi. I can't, guys. I'm trying here. <laughs> we who are clay blended by the master potter come from the kiln of creation in many hues. How can people say one skin is colored? when each has its own coloration. What should it matter that one bowl is dark and the other pale, if each is of good design and serves its purpose well? Navajo song, it's, okay, I guess it's a Navajo song. Walk on a rainbow trail. <laughs> I'm reading this with too much hip hop subtext, you know. <clears throat> Walk on a rainbow trail. Walk on a trail of, of song and all about you will be beauty. There is a way out of every dark mist over a rainbow trail. You see, it was, it was, the, myth, mytholo it was the mythological connection of the human personality to the ecosystem. That means <clears throat> that means I think if you were a Cherokee, you would feel aliens landed in Europe first. <laughs> because technology was so alien to the primitive tribal mind that it's, it, it is alien, is it not? If you were looking through the eyes of someone who was just like nature was your technology, then you're like, people are driving cars? Like, don't they realize they can kind of like, you know, ride giant eagles? <laughs> but guys, it's very important. Animals do have rights. Um, in my science fiction novel, I'll share with you a chapter. Um, and it's, I've created, I'll tell you this, I'll share you the idea. <clears throat> it's said in the year 5025, the world is divided between the futurists and the traditionalists. The world is incredibly multidimensional. There isn't just one parallel reality of Earth. There's one ultimate government that is called the Enlightened Society, and it began when they voted the first artist as a politician. In my science fiction novel, it's like this. Okay. And so what happens is that the Enlightened Society begins treating every product of the human mind as artwork but artwork that has to learn to coexist. So the artist has to now, in some sense, also not just create, again, adjust their creation to the world that it's enduring through. Do you know? So you can say it's as if we have this idea when a person creates something, they're done with it and they move on to the next. Like when, when you draw a painting as an artist, you don't just stare at that painting. You know what I mean? your whole life you put the painting somewhere after you've drawn it and you move on to another moment of sensory 
color. Anyways, guys, I'm going to continue with this quote tunnel. These quotes are incredible so far. So what should it matter that one bowl is dark and the other pale if each is of good design and serves its purpose well? <clears throat> oh, no, 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 I read that. All right, let's go. This one's a good one. It's from Crowfoot Blackfoot. What is life? It is the flash of a firefly in the night. It is the breath of a buffalo in the winter time. It is the little shadow which runs across the grass and loses itself in the sunset. Wow. You see, guys, I can totally see why it made sense for people to be pantheists. Because nature was the was moving more advanced than our imaginations. So it was our imaginations. But now it's shifted because we, by living unnaturally, like I find myself that there's some human beings that they're, in, they're literally born to return to nature and there's some beings born to actually not to be in nature, you know? And yet, in both situations, both have access to their human nature at all times. Like, you're, you're, you're not a robot, you're a human being. That means you feel your world. You don't just see it and process it like a robot, you know. <clears throat> and this is like some nice, you know, Cherokee haiku. You know, what is life? It's a flash of a firefly in the night. It is the breath of a buffalo in the winter time. It is the little shadow which runs across the grass and loses itself in the sunset. Guys, this quote was so nice. Like, I just had to read it one more time so I remember it. Hold on to what is good, even if it is a handful of earth. Pueblo, Pueblo Blessing is saying this. Pu, Pueblo Pl Blessing is saying this. Hold on to what is good, even if it is a handful of earth. Hold on to what you believe, even if it is a tree which stands by itself. Hold on to what you must do, even if it is a long way from here. Hold on to life, even when it is easier letting go. Hold on to my hand, even when I have gone away from you. Wow, wow. That's the connection to the ancestors. That's realizing that life... Its meaning is its endurance so far. And now it's your turn, dear listener. You are sent forth by your ancestors as if they were all the Jedis that came before you. <laughs> you know, you can say Star Wars is very multicultural. That moment where the ancestors, where the spirits of the fallen Jedi are beside the Jedi... You know what that means? <clears throat> that means the Jedi's power comes from the remembrance of the source of its force. So what it means is if this concept of a force, like it was extracted from ancient mythological, I could tell you, not mythological, mystical patterns, mystical ideology, you know? Gary White Deer, Chickasaw, 1994, says, I think the spirit is the one thing we have to rely on. It has been handed to us as a live and precious coal. And each generation has to make that decision whether they want to blow on that coal to keep it alive or throw it away. Our language, our histories and culture are like a big uh, ceremonial fire that's been kicked and stomped and scattered. Out in the darkness, we can see those coals glowing, but our generation, whether in tribal government or whether we find ourselves Choctaw, Cherokee, Chickasaw, Creek, Seminole, are coal gatherers. We bring the coals back, assemble them and breathe on them again so we can spark a flame around which we might warm ourselves. You see, guys, that's the interesting thing. It's not just children in school getting bullied. It's patterns of thinking 
bulldozering over ways of life. So the technological innovation should be to instantly get build sky cities. I'm telling you guys, that's my vision of Civilization 2.0. We're all going to be living in the sky for 2,000 years. Phase 2 of Civilization 2.0, heaven eyes, earth heaven up, you know. And then Phase 3, interstellar advancement or endless cyberspace, you know, ad infinitum exploration, I don't know. But all the, the idea of Civilization 2.0, Phase 3 of it will happen... Or the idea will happen 600 years from now if certain great transformations occur. I'm writing a book on this, so, so don't worry about this, guys. This is, uh, there's, going, there's going to be more on this. <clears throat> Chiawa James Monarch 1996 says, Learn how to withhold judgment. Learn to listen. Get in touch with your own inner self. Look at life with joy. Don't ever cry over something that cannot cry over you. Wow, 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 wow. Guys, I'm going to post this. Don't ever cry over something that cannot cry over you. That means don't cry over inanimate objects. That means realize the mind is holding the body as the body holds the mind. And free will is conditional because we have to go to sleep and there's that gap, you know? So guys, check this out. There's just a, a couple quotes left. I'm going to read them. Chief Seattle says, Suquamish, Chief Seattle, Suquamish, Duwamish, 1719, 90 to 1866. So this was when this was said by Chief Seattle. When the last red man shall have become a myth among the white men, when your children's children think themselves alone in the field, upon the highway, or in the silence of the pathless woods, they will not be alone. In all the earth there is no place dedicated to solitude. Wow. At night when the streets of your cities are silent, they will throng with the returning hosts that once filled them and still love this beautiful land. The white man will never be alone. You see, guys, really, that's the thing. You ask chaos to stop. If it doesn't, you just hope it be. It just makes wise decisions. I I would say that the the inner realms of the Cherokee were was ahead of their time. You know, it was a rare. I, I think. You know, it's, it's, I, I, I think I was like the last, like, I, I don't know how many kids nowadays climb trees. Very few kids might be climbing trees. That means the interaction with nature has been replaced with a sort of cyber exchange of our attention into being. That's why for me, I'm like, Okay, so what happens? Either the internet becomes this um, cloud of just information and every person who goes into it, there's a lot of information. You know, you know how much of the internet is not even indexed? So, so, it, so it's as if like we are in this cloud of information. Now, if this information doesn't, if, if the entertainment, in, like I can't believe, I can, it shocked me, guys. Now, do you know the future of education is the entertainment industry? That means there is a sort of need for the entertainment industry to advance the technology of entertainment, right? So when entertainment becomes more attention-grabbing, then in some sense... Uh, what the teacher in the school is saying, the entertainment is the true teacher, actually. The, the being's attention is learning more from, for example, the TV screen than, for example, the concepts in a book. 
So you see, now we're becoming scribes of written language into cyberspace value, into digital value, you know? It's an interesting time, you know? We are realizing we are the creator of a world that we were never in. The last quote is from Black Elk, Oglala Asiu. You have noticed that everything an Indian does is in a circle. And that is because the power of the world always works in circles, and everything tries to be round. In the old days, all our power came to us from the sacred hoop of the nation, and so long as the hoop was unbroken, the people flourished. The flowering trees was the living center of the hoop, and the circle of the four quarters nourished it. The east gave peace and light, the south gave warmth, the west gave rain, and the north with its cold and mighty wind gave strength and endurance. This knowledge came to us from the outer world with our religion. Everything the power of the world does is done in a circle. The sky is round, and I have heard that the earth is round like a ball, and so are all the stars. The wind in its greatest power whirls, birds make their nests in circles, for their for, for theirs is the same religion as ours. The sun comes forth and goes down again in a circle. The moon does the same and both are round. Even the seasons form a great circle and they're changing and always come back again to where they were. <clears throat> the life of, ma of a man is a circle from childhood to childhood and so it is in everything where power moves. It, so it is in everything where power moves. Our teepees were round like the nests of birds, and these were always set in a circle, the nation's hoop, a nest of many nests, where the great spirit meant for us to hatch our children. You know, when your world is healthy, you will feel your health. And if we can build at least a certain bunker of a simulation of enough of an advanced world for the future generations just to get the ball rolling, then it will automatically happen. You see, it's as if like people, they're not just defined by the information they get. An event in your life is literally a new moment of being in form, you know, as a life form. So, so it's literally automatically information. You know, there's two ways. Either you sit in room, okay, let's say there's room A and B. One way of getting information from room B, when you're in room A, you're like, all right, I go on the internet and get information on room B. Or you open the door and go in room B. So there's the direct experience and then there's the in indirect potential of, of the action, you know. Guys, these quotes were remarkable, you know was one of them that uh, was so powerful.
So, um, Dylan, I, I just saw your comment. So, guys, I'm going to show you a comment because it's interesting. So, guys, Dylan says, Ben, couldn't you say that spirits are moving with or in Wi-Fi? Listen, if we identify the spirit as the shape, then it's not a spirit, I would say. I would say the whole point of it, it's either this or that. Do you know what I mean? Like on some level, it's like from, you see, it's it, the middle way that Buddha spoke. It's only the non-dual awareness. But when you move, when the physical body needs to maintain, you're actually spinning in various dualities. So that means just like how the world has a sort of access, so do you. You just, you just don't realize you. I call it you, uh, every human being has a principle, universal philosophy, which means literally the first time they felt like a person, how the world was. And when you get to that moment, you suddenly find a comfort with your inner realms. Once you return to how you created your own value in your conscious moment, then you realize it's like the grand empty page, you know, that our intelligence is just paint on this canvas. You know, as far as I'm concerned, I'm the most, uh, it's like not just me, just all human beings or the humanity is the most rarest thing. It's like, we don't see other you other civilizations. You see, it's like Fermi's paradox again, where, where are the aliens? So it's an empty solar system. So isn't it strange that we're in this giant empty room? Right? So what are we doing in an empty room? You know? And so for now, we have colored the walls of this empty room that we're considering the universe with language, with theories, with various ways of interpretation. And I'm saying eventually the languages are divided. They, they will eventually, geometry is the, I mentioned it earlier, is the next great language of all languages. I feel geometry is... Um, uh, the geometry is a very important phase in our evolution and we're opening up to it in our inner realms. So anyways, guys, thanks for tuning in. Let me see what, what comes, uh, what if nature was on your side? And the times I felt nature was on my side was when I felt I saw the mind of my moment before the mind of my personality. That means if you are a person, suddenly open your eyes in a room and you're in somewhere in some world. So the, the first effort, where the first direction of your effort as, a, as your effort as a being is the projection of the archetype. So believe it or not, it's kind of like how consciousness walks in the room suggests the, uh, what dimension is perceived. So what that means is it's a stoic approach to our imagination. Where the stoics kind of have this view where it's your behavior. So in, in stoicism, we can say of the likes of Epictetus, where he says, we don't suffer from the events in our lives. We suffer, uh, we, don't, we, su we suffer not from the events in our lives, but from our judgments about them. So I feel it's one of those things where we looked at objective phenomena, we stopped judging it. We're like, all right, at the, we'll let the atoms be, we'll stop, you know you know, disturbing atoms. And we stabilize into this materialism in our thought, in our being. Now I'm saying you can't avoid the imagination. You know, why would Albert Einstein say, you know, something like imagination is like a sign of intel true intelligence or something? Because his theory was an imagination before he theorized it. It was the space where the world was more than what it was. Because there's life here, you know. And so isn't it strange that we just don't want our physical bodies to survive as long as possible. We also want what the physical body is carrying. The vision of the free will of the... Believe it or not, it's hilarious when they say, you know, they say some people are self-made, you know. 
you know, and you know, on some level, psychologically, that's true. <sighs> Nature is your greatest ally because it is uh, the presence of your mind, and when you when you acknowledge the presence of your mind, the personality, like Chung Chung Su says, beliefs they're like leaves on a tree; they change as the seasons change. That means every day that you change as a person, you're not the same. You, how can you have the same belief if you're a different person? How can you have the same belief as 10 years ago when you've experienced so many other dimensions of life that have recalibr recalibrated how you are as a being? Or how, in, in what ways your attention moves? Or how the pilot navigates their attention in this plane? And I use that analogy because it is really like your inner realms are kind of like an airplane where you're a pilot of. When you share it with others, then they are kind of like, you know, they, they are, they see the form, the inner form. So anyways, thanks for listening, guys. I hope this talk was helpful. And uh, think of it this way. You, every person is dropped first in the island of their mind. Your inner realms, it's, it's not like you don't have imagination. It's just that you're not looking at it. And what it means is that when you wonder about the evolution of reality, eventually you come to the edge of your conce conception ability, then wonder comes in. When wonder comes in, you look at things again, and then you see another layer of, potential to things we have to set the world into motion through our clearest vision and that clarity is an awareness to the environment so you would say it's as if hearing the voice of nature before you shout into the world that means inevitably I think it's a suggestion that the world is alive and if the world is alive, you know, it's as if like there's a nature to it. Nature has a nature hilariously, you know, the nature of nature. <laughs> we are like the inner nature being simultaneously the outer nature. It's a fascinating time to be alive. The mysteries still stand, you know, AI hasn't come in to solve everything. So it's, it, it's an incredible time for philosophers and poets and artists to kind of roar in the streets of uh, the modern civilization, you know. So anyways, guys, thanks for tuning in. Much blessings and namaste.